What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Marvel Standom Live. I am your host, Mike Cicchini, and with me for all time and always, I have my spider friends, Denny Geek News and Features Editor Kirsten Howard, and Denny Geek TV Editors Katie Burt and Alec Bajalid. And today, this is a kind of uh, different episode of Marvel Standom Live. We are going to take a deep dive into the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy. And before we get started, we should just uh, talk about our sponsor really quickly because this episode of Marvel Standom is sponsored by Plex. They are the current streaming home of the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy. You can watch Sam Raimi's original Spider-Man trilogy free, presented by Crackle on Plex. This limited time engagement ends March 1st, so you'll want to act faster than Spidey can sling those webs. Plex has over 50,000 free on-demand titles and over 200 live TV channels. Download the Plex app today, free on all your favorite devices to start watching. So this is a trilogy. It's a big one. It is a like possibly the most important superhero trilogy of its era. So we are going to start right at the beginning with the first film. Kirsty, why don't you tell everybody what this one's all about? I thought we were going to do the news first, Mike. <laughs> That's right. We are You're doing this. Throw me right first. off immediately. Uh, no, this is what I get for being a wise guy. You know what? Let's do the news first. You're gonna have to wait for the the yeah. recap of the twenty year old. <laughs> 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 they may have seen Spider Man one before. We don't know. Um, okay, some Marvel news. Just a couple of little bits this week. Good news for Loki fans. Backstage have reported that season two of the God of Mischief series will start filming this summer at Pinewood Studios here in the UK. No further information about season two has been forthcoming yet, but when we last saw Loki, he was returning to the TVA to warn Mobius about everything he'd witnessed during his run-in with He Who Remains. Unfortunately, as you may recall, Mobius didn't have a clue who he was, and a statue of Kang suddenly stood proudly at the TVA. A very Planet of the Apes-esque cliffhanger. We can probably expect Owen Wilson to return in season two opposite Tom Hiddleston, and I suspect it won't be long until we catch up with Sophia G. Martino's Sylvie again, since Loki isn't known for forgetting anything of value too quickly. Another little bit of news, uh, Moon Knight director Aaron Moorhead has indicated that fans of he and Justin Benson's indie horror films will be happy with their episodes of the show, as the vibes they brought to the likes of The Endless and Resolution will likely be as apparent as they were during the instalments of Archive 81 that the duo recently held for Netflix. The found footage series has been a clear winner on the streaming service and really manages to make some of the schlocky supernatural stuff quite creepy. Has anyone in the chat watched Archive 81? If so, what did you think? Alec, I know you binged it last week. What were your feelings about it? Um, I thought it was an excellent uh, two-hour movie that was an eight-hour TV show. But <laughs> it was really well done and uh, well-directed, well-edited. So I think there's plenty to look forward to for the future of that crew. Okay, Mike, I'm happy to. <laughs> <Carry on now. laughs> Should we get into it? How well, about that Spider-Man? <laughs> before we do that, just a reminder to everybody that you can follow all of our Marvel coverage and stay up to date with all the happenings in the Marvel universe over at our web home of denageek.com slash Marvel. So head over there. Check out our daily Marvel updates while you're waiting for new episodes of Marvel Standom. And now it's time to dig into that first Spider-Man movie. Kirsty, back to you. <laughs> I'm ready. Okay, Spider-Man starring Tobey Maguire, Willem Dafoe, Kirsten Dunst and James Franco is an origin story for Peter Parker, where he develops spider-like superhuman abilities after a genetically altered spider bites him. He then uses those powers to fight crime as Spider-Man. Many people had actually worked to make a live-action Spider-Man film happen in the 80s. Toby Hooper, James Cameron and Joseph Zito all wanted to direct a Spider-Man movie, but thanks to licensing and money problems, the idea languished. But in 19 1999, Columbia Pictures acquired options from MGM and Sony hired David Coop to create a working screenplay for Spider-Man. The likes of Ang Lee, Michael Bay, M. Night Shyamalan and David Fincher were all in the running before Rainey was hired in 2000. 
Spider-Man was eventually released in 2002. It got good reviews and it was the first film to reach 100 million in a single weekend, as well as the most successful film based on a comic book movie, based on a comic book at the time, with a box office gross of 821 million worldwide. Spider-Man has been said to have redefined the modern superhero genre and even the summer blockbuster itself. <laughs> I kind of came of age on the internet like at the time that that movie was in development like i had my first computer i w had my own place for the first time and i followed every minute of development with this movie i had read the james cameron uh you know script treatment which was like a fascinating read at the time and i remember all the build up to when they finally announced Sam Raimi as director. And as somebody who was completely obsessed with Army of Darkness as a teenager, like I was like, I can't believe that Sam Raimi is gonna, you know, is gonna direct this movie. And so, um, you know, it was kind of like the early days of, um, of internet fandom as well. I mean, the, there was a website just called Spider-Man Hype and all they did all day long was just like, every rumor every tiny piece of news about this movie and i lived i lived on the front page of that website waiting for stuff so it was uh it was quite a time and it felt like it took forever for it actually to get made but it, like whenever we talk about these movies it always brings me back to a very particular point in my life it brings me back too and i was experiencing something very different i did not I had not read any of the Spider-Man comic books. I didn't necessarily already care about Spider-Man, but I did care about blockbusters and <laughs> went to see as many as I could um, at my local movie theater. So I do remember seeing this without any sort of, um, you know, context other than like the broad marketing. And yeah, I mean, I think it might've been the first, I think it might've been the first comic book movie I saw in theaters because I didn't see the first X-Men in theaters. I saw X-Men 2, but I think that came out the year after. So rewatching it as someone who's now seen so many comic book movies and has such a, a knowledge of the, of the format was really interesting. Um, and also made me very nostalgic for, um, yeah, what my life was like and what Hollywood looked like at the time when this movie came out, because it feels, it feels like it really bridges a gap between two eras of Hollywood in a really interesting way. That is interesting, because I didn't realize that we all had kind of a weird, not weird, but just like a personal connection to this movie, because this is the movie that I think, if I'm remembering correctly, the first movie I was ever excited to see in theaters. Aww. So, what were you doing before that? <laughs> going to movies, but like not looking forward to it. It's oh, like, you're just like, dragged by your parents to the movie theater again and again. Well, when you're a kid, you're not that discerning. Like you go to the, you go to the movies. Speak like for you yourself, the, Alec. Like, <laughs> like it's always going to be fun. It doesn't necessarily matter what's on the screen. Yeah. It's just the novelty of seeing like a big story and eating popcorn. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is the one I, the, the first thing I remember like actively looking forward to. Uh, and I remember it was the, this movie's trailer was the first one that I watched ad nauseum online uh, because my dad introduced me to apple.com backslash trailers. <laughs> I, don't know why. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. I don't yeah. know why Apple hosted all of these trailers, but it was just like a landing page with yeah. trailers and the novelty of getting to watch trailers in home on a, on a computer was mind blowing. <laughs> well, I watched this trailer like 155 times. Um, and I remember the biggest moment in the trailer is uh, like the highlight of the whole thing is uh, Peter h trying to hide from uh, Norman Osborn uh, when he's on the ceiling and the, the blood droplet comes down and almost hits Osborn. Like that's how that was the climax of the trailer. But I don't know, anyway, ended up being a pretty good movie too, in addition to a good trailer. <laughs> But does anybody here remember the original teaser for this movie? <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> I, I think I do. And if, I think, if it is what I think it is, I'm yeah, upset. Uh, yeah, I, I, I have ve very distinct memories of like desperately waiting for this trailer to like load and just like buffer and buffer and buffer and basically watching it a second at a time. But it's it's like a bunch of bank robbers like making a getaway 
And it's like a big elaborate getaway that involves a helicopter. And then at the end of it, the helicopter gets stuck in a web that has been spun between the Twin Towers at the World Trade Center. Um, you know, and Spider-Man was released in May 2002, um, you know, and this teaser was released the previous summer. And needless to say, uh, you know, after the, the tragic events of that September, this was quickly scrubbed from the Internet. But in in what really feels like, you know, ancient history at this point, I distinctly remember crowding around like a crappy little monitor with my roommates just like watching that trailer unfold about three seconds at a time over a lousy dial up internet connection, you know? So <laughs> I remember doing that with, we don't want to get too off topic, but the first Harry Potter movie, that exact experience. And just like going back to the beginning and watch as far as it had loaded going back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and now here we are like streaming live, uh, you know, hopefully without any technical difficulties, but I'm sure I just cursed us. So, um, <laughs> But look, we've, we've kind of talked about the lead up to this movie. What are everybody's impressions of this film? Because one thing about this, it's a trilogy directed by director with a very particular style, right? I mean, Sam Raimi is an unmistakable Hollywood presence. And it's rare, and it was particularly rare back then, that one director would kind of steward an entire saga of, of a superhero movie. Usually you'd get the, the creative differences would come in somewhere midway, midway into the production of the second film and somebody else would be brought in. But like, these are all, all three of these are recognizably Sam Raimi movies. And the tone that is set in the first one it's very consistent, like all the way through to the third one. So what are everybody's impressions of this? It was just so fun to watch a superhero origin story that wasn't afraid to be a superhero origin story and like defensive about it and like, but it's different this time. There's like a <laughs> simplicity and clarity to this story that was really nice to watch um, because I think for better and worse, the superhero movies have gotten a lot more crowded and complicated. Um, and yeah, to watch this, movie and to yeah i don't know i just i i loved i loved the simplicity of it and i was surprised at also how like old it felt not in a bad way but like it felt like an old-fashioned way of storytelling that i do think i miss as well so to see a superhero movie like yeah i don't know it was really fun to watch this, and I kind of feel like I'm stuck in a loop maybe now where I'm just going to watch the trilogy and then watch No Way Home <laughs> and then watch the trilogy because these these movies obviously are really now just tied into the MCU in a really interesting way. Um, so, yeah, I definitely recommend the experience of, of watching them or re-watching them if you haven't recently. Yeah, I think audiences have also got more savvy now, haven't they? There's a, there's an innocence to this first movie um, that I really enjoy. It was really interesting watching it again, just in the context of how far we've come, you know, 27 MCU movies and Spider-Man No Way Home recently. Um, it was just a, very interesting to look back and, um, yeah, a good experience after watching No Way Home to revisit these movies, I thought. I agree with you both about um, kind of it being a throwback because when uh, when we decided to to do this as a as a topic and we had to go back and watch them, kind of the internal prompt I was working off of in my head not, not a prompt that anybody gave to me just something that was self directed for some reason was that like you know Spider Man oh those are the first of kind of like the modern era superhero movies and I think I just thought that because it was my introduction to superhero. Mm -hmm more or less with you know an x-men give or take um but going back and watching it it really is a throwback like tone wise plot wise sensibility and style wise it really feels like it has more in common with like um, like 70s donner mm -hmm. superman than the mcu um it's just kind of like a refreshingly small and intimate story in which uh, Spider-Man does a lot of really like Spider-Man things, catches uh, bad guys. And e I think in each and every one of these movies, not just the first one, somebody, some criminal gets their hands on a giant bag of money with a dollar sign on it. Like <laughs> it's really just quite a charming throwback in that aspect. 
And it's nice to see uh, Spider-Man doing friendly you neighborhood know, Spider-Man things. It's funny that you everybody kind of has this same vibe about how old fashioned this movie feels. And like, yes, some of that is just kind of like late 90s blockbuster filmmaking tropes. But a lot of it, that is kind of Sam Raimi's sensibility. You know, even even with stuff like like Evil Dead 2, like this is a guy who who loves the Three Stooges, you know, who wanted old school kind of physical comedy and slapstick brought in with his horror, you know. And there's all kinds of like the atmosphere of like universal horror movies of the of the early 1940s that you can see in things like Army of Darkness. So Sam Raimi is like so well versed in these old Hollywood styles, and that comes through a lot in in these Spider-Man movies. And like there are little moments throughout where it's like that's a very distinctive Raimi touch, but then it's also like, yeah, but that's also Sam Raimi doing like a universal horror movie from like 1939, you know? And and it's really neat the way that all plays. <laughs> and this is, look, origin stories as a whole have kind of fallen out of fashion in superhero movies. And that's probably for the best. But part of that is because there are a handful of superhero movies, and this is one of them, where the origin story format is done so well that there's just no reason to ever revisit it. You know, you have like Donner's Superman in 1978. You have this movie. You have Christopher Nolan's Batman Begins, you know, maybe Patty Jenkins' Wonder Woman. But like, these are like perfect, perfect, perfect superhero origin stories. And they're stories that are so well known and so well worn throughout popular culture that like, why even bother trying to film this again? Why even bother trying to tell this story in another format? Like, I think that was one of the great victories of the MCU Spider-Man was they knew there was like, there's no reason for us to revisit any of the beats that you know people traditionally associate with spider-man stories right now because we're never going to do it on film as well as sam raimi did in this first movie you know so um yeah i i, I was i'm i was impressed on this watch by how well this holds up i don't have a lot of patience for origin story movies anymore outside of donner's superman which is my favorite movie ever made uh you know and nolan's batman begins but watching this i'm like this is this is just how it's done this is definitive this is that amazing fantasy 15 story brought to life it's spectacular yeah there are things that it does better than um subsequent spider-man eras as well like one of the the criticisms i have of the newest spider-man the tom holland spider-man is that i never feel like i understood what um, Peter's relationship was with Aunt May and this movie just does that so well like the little family that um, Peter and Aunt May and Uncle Ben have is established and makes you care about these characters um, it was so hard for me to watch Uncle Ben die again <laughs> um, because I cared yeah I cared so much about them and I knew I knew how much that would impact this character um, and yeah for something that has been done again and again subsequently, both in the Spider-Man universe, but also in other superhero movies, for that trope to still work so well on me in this movie, I think is really impressive and does say a lot about Sam Raimi's direction. Um, it also just makes me more excited to see him direct uh, another superhero movie um, in Doctor Strange. I yeah with this in mind like just seeing what he did here he's obviously like a very different director today and i and superhero movies are in a very different place so i'm curious to see what that looks like yeah it's a really good time to revisit this trilogy between no way home and doctor strange in the multiverse of madness isn't it yeah i hadn't really thought about that aspect of it when we went to rewatch <laughs> i just thought about the no way home aspect and now i'm like I you all know that I have my reservations about Doctor Strange. <laughs> and I am excited to see the movie, generally. But this made me... This gave me another reason to um, to be excited about it and to find interest in it, even if I don't like it. Which I don't know if I will or won't. You know, you mentioned Uncle Ben and Aunt May. And Cliff Robertson is so amazing as Uncle Ben. And Rosemary Harris is like low key the MVP of at least these first two movies. Like mm -hmm. she is so good. She is exactly the Aunt May of the 60s, 70s and 80s comics. Like 
brought to life in a way you know usually when you talk about superhero movie castings it's like how well do the leads embody like the main characters of this like rosemary harris is like is 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 like is like is like she stepped off the page and she's and she's clearly having fun with the role as well and she's so sincere and every line of dialogue that cliff robertson speaks it doesn't even feel like it was written it's like it's like here is this like sweet genuine old man like speaking to us the audience from his heart and i just absolutely love him and and like it really you know that's such that's a moment that could be done wrong in so many ways and this movie gets it like it absolutely gets it so i i i once again i got to give it up for like kind of the, the the second the secondary players in this movie before we start talking about you know Toby Maguire and Kirsten Dunst and and of course Willem Dafoe, you know, it's uh, it's good stuff. Um what are some of our favorite scenes in this flick? I only have eyes for Bonesaw. My maybe my favorite my favorite sequence in the whole trilogy. Uh it gets cuz that really kind of captures that same Raimi sensibility um of like I think he has this implicit understanding that art in the real world are not the same thing, which sounds like a simple observation. But that's not necessarily the route that a lot of superhero movies have taken in recent years. Like there's a really cartoonish element at play here that comes through in uh, the wrestling sequence. The, it's to the extent where I'm not sure that Sam Raimi knows that wrestling isn't real. Uh, like at one point in that scene, some guy is beaten to near death by boats and he's being dragged out on oh, my leg. <laughs> That is a wonderful sequence. Yeah, and and the casting of uh, Macho Man Randy Savage, the legendary Macho Man Randy Savage as Bonesaw McGraw for this scene is completely inspired. Like, and some of you may know, I am a sucker for a homemade Spider-Man costume. Like, I don't think there's a single MCU suit that looks as good as what Peter's wearing in this scene. And also for the record, like the, the homemade suit that Tom Holland wears in a few scenes in Spider-Man Homecoming, like that's what I want to see more of. Like to me, that's Spider-Man, the guy who's just kind of getting by here, you know? But this scene is amazing. Like it speaks to me as a wrestling fan. It's another thing that feels like it came right off the comic book page. You know, there is unfortunately that one, uh, you know, kind of gratuitous line that doesn't play as well in the modern day as, uh, you know, as it might have 20 years ago where Spidey is clearly on the wrong side of history. That's a cute outfit. Did your husband give it to you? You know, like we, we, we try not to focus on that too much. It was a different time. It's just one element of these movies that maybe hasn't aged as well as the rest of them. My friends and I, when talking about Spider-Man, still just run through a whole coterie of um, bone saw quotes. <laughs> it's, like Macho Man Randy Savage is maybe, you talk about coming directly off the comic book page. Uh, there's Aunt May, there's J. Jonah Jameson, and then there's Bonesaw, who like I, I, is just absolutely perfect. And like I said, you got you for three minutes. I don't know if we're allowed to talk about the main players yet, but I was... I was surprised, and this is not like a hot take, <laughs> how much I loved Willem Dafoe in this. Like, I don't remember particularly caring about his character the first time I watched this, um, but especially from a modern context, um, he's obviously an amazing actor, but I love how over the top he is as the Green Goblin. Um, I feel like there's sometimes a pressure now for villains to be very like, grounded and serious and he is like he very much does do that when he is in Norman Osborne mode but he's just I don't know he's just so maniacal <laughs> as the Green Goblin and I found myself enjoying that more than I was expecting I love Willem Dafoe too so really any scene that he's in is spectacular for me um, that final fight as well with Spidey I think is still really impactful when I was watching it again. I thought that looked really good. And I think it is just the physical onset, you know, the fight that they're doing is not is not very CGI laden mm. or anything like that. It just, it feels personal between these two. I think it, it is a little bit odd because they are wearing their masks throughout, you know, much of it and, um, 
you can't see Willem Dafoe's face really so it's all in their movements when they when they have to face off but it it does uh, it does really still hit me quite hard I know the MCU has made it like a concerted effort to put you know more faces to its costumed heroes you know you get that look inside Iron Man's helmet or you know Star-Lord takes his helmet off to talk or or even Spider-Man's like a mask comes down now you know <laughs> so um but I do think that um even with that in the way of them communicating with each other it it still feels really intense between them I'm going to take it a step further and say that that fight scene that final fight in that like abandoned hospital or whatever it is is not only probably the best scene in the whole trilogy for me that scene is that's a better action sequence than just about anything the mcu has done in 27 movies like that is it's one of the moments in the film where sam raimi is very clearly being allowed to be sam raimi you know there is there is a touch of that uh evil dead style like serious violence in it these two are just beating the absolute crap out of each other and it's just filmed and cut in that very distinctive Sam Raimi way and it looks great I can't think of an I seriously can't think of a single instance of hand-to-hand -hand combat in the entire MCU that looks as good as that scene I don't know that's a larger that's a larger discussion <laughs> I I regrettably think he's right <laughs> I think it's an awesome scene so physical it is a good scene but I do think the thing that really makes it stand out for me is uh, what Kirsty was saying about it feeling so personal. That this trilogy and especially the first two films do such a good job of of never letting the viewer forget about the humanity of the villain and the tragedy in their villainy. And you know the fact that the last thing um, Norman says is you know don't tell Harry is so sad. It's and you know. Norman cares about, he cares about Harry, obviously. He cares about Peter, and he's been this mentor figure. So I think, yeah, making that so personal makes the stakes, the physical stakes of this fight feel that much heavier or that much higher. It makes me wish that, you know, so much of Defoe's performance was not hidden behind that mask. Mm -hmm. You know, like, there were... There, there were attempts. I mean, they built like an animatronic mask that would have allowed more of his performance to actually come through. And they unfortunately didn't go with it um, because really so much of what he's doing. And look, Goblin is supposed to be an over the top, like very manic kind of character, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I really wish that we had more moments like that where you kind of see the real Norman Osborn breaking through every now and then, or the moments when you're not supposed to be sure whether it's the real Norman or not, mm. you know? I mean, like, it's, it's, an, it's another bit of perfect casting. And, you know, we could have seen some more scary stuff with this because there are those transitional moments where we see Norman kind of like coming in or out of, you know, his goblin trance and he's doing like those evil dead eye rolls, you know, mm. it's just more stuff where whenever Sam Raimi is directing people in an especially Sam Raimi way, that's when this movie kind of really like rises above the pack. I will say in response that a, it's still not as bad as Oscar Isaac in apocalypse No. and B <laughs> never forget. <laughs> <laughs> and B, Willem Dafoe has is just such a strong like voice performer that I feel like he brings so much of that character through his voice performance, which yeah, it's they really nailed it with his casting in this film. It's hard to imagine anyone else in that role. It's really well with like gestures and stuff too under the mask. I'm thinking in particular of a moment where like um he's kidnapped Spider-Man and he's trying to do the we're not so different you and I thing. And there's this thing where he just like casually casually flops down on like a rock next to him like this. <laughs> and it just it's just filled with personality despite having this green expressionless face. <laughs> they should have let Oscar Oscar Isaac do that. <laughs> <laughs> what about um you know we haven't talked about our two leads yet. You know, we have not talked about Peter and MJ and Toby Maguire and Kirsten Dunst. I think are great in this movie. 
And, you know, I know there are issues with like, you know, how they're treated as we go on in the trilogy. But I think here, everything that the two of them have going on just feels so kind of pure and real. And like, it's not, it doesn't feel contrived. And, you know, I, I, I'm really impressed by them. I personally was never the biggest fan of Toby's Spider-Man, but I still think he's a great Peter. Um, and like, there's so, like, it's funny. We brought up this, this shot of the two of them in the lunchroom, which is another great scene. Like, it's just such like effortless, cute chemistry with them at every opportunity. I love Kirsten Dunst then, now, and always. And I do get frustrated with some of the limitations that are put on her character here, but I think she does such a good job with what she's given. Um, and in terms of Tobey Maguire, he's not my f favorite Spider-Man either but i was one of the things that i was reflecting on while rewatching these was how he is the best for me at least at being like believably like awkward and nerdy and weird <laughs> like i i never really buy it from andrew garfield or tom holland like they're like hollywood nerdy and like toby Maguire is obviously still hollywood nerdy but yeah like especially in this film at the beginning when he's still in high school you just really buy his like isolation and loneliness in a way that I don't really with the other spider man Yeah, I don't know if I have a strong Tobey Maguire or Kirsten Dunst. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, just by by mere vir virtue of the time those movies came around, they'll always be my on-screen uh, Peter and MJ. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree with you, Katie, though. His... Uh, Tobey Maguire's kind of, like, meek physicality in the first act of the movie really does work. Um, get, and he gets bossed around by like these Stephen King esque bullies. Led by they're so <laughs> large. <laughs> and they're so rude and mean to him. No, I kept just being like, why? They're so mean. They're so mean. Yeah. That's another thing that kind of dates this movie. Like, where pe people just seem to be a lot meaner in the past. <laughs> or maybe, yeah, I don't know. That's, that is also a large subject. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not in high school anymore. So let's talk about the degradation of man's soul. <laughs> yeah, I gotta, gotta be. Honest, I don't. I don't know if I have a hot take in me about either of them. I think they're both fine. Yeah. I like. Yeah. Um. Like. Uh. I, I try to say this in, in the least gross way possible. I, I like Kirsten Dunst's like appearance. Like she just <laughs> looks the part, and she's very colorful. Like down to the hair, like her makeup and um her wardrobe. It, she really fits into the whole comic booky vibe. I think my favorite moment with her in this whole movie is is when we first meet her at the at the museum, you know, before they go into the laboratory, and she's just like clowning around, posing for posing for pics for Peter, and it's just like the most natural thing in the world, you know what I mean? And it's like it's like yeah, like I, I like it's like you know this person, you know, and like that's that's such a difficult quality to get across in a movie like this. I think maybe especially for actors, especially like Kristen Dunst at the this point had been acting for years and doing a very good job i think it's funny when actors who know how to be on camera are supposed to act like they don't know how to be on camera i always, I always find joy in that <laughs> should we uh should we start talking about the sequel now because to many folks spider-man 2 is the superior film so um you know just before we get into that just want to remind everybody that this episode of Marvel Standom is sponsored by Plex, the current streaming home of the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy. You can watch Sam Raimi's original Spider-Man trilogy for free, presented by Crackle on Plex. This limited time engagement ends March 1st, so you'll want to act faster than Spidey can sling those webs. Plex has over 50,000 free on-demand titles and over 200 live TV channels. Download the Plex app today, folks, free on all your favorite devices to start watching. So, Spider-Man 2. Kirsty, go for it. 2004's Spider-Man 2 saw Raimi return to the director's chair and Tobey Maguire reprise the role of Peter Parker, but not without incident, a back injury that Maguire sustained during production on Seabiscuit almost saw him replaced with Jake Gyllenhaal. Thankfully, Maguire recovered in time for the sequel and the film ended up grossing 789 million worldwide. It's set two years after the events of Spider-Man, where Peter is trying to balance his personal life with being Spidey. Peter's mentor, Dr. Otto Octavius, also turns villain after a failed experiment leaves him neurologically fused to metal tentacles. 
Spider-Man 2 featuring like arguably the the greatest comic book villain performance ever put on screen with Alfred Molina as Otto Octavius. I know that's a pretty conventional take from people, but you know what? After rewatching this, I think it holds water. Like this is this is really a wonderful role that he brings a lot of nuance to. Um, you know, you're I making wish some big statements, time. Mike. I was not prepared for this. <laughs> Look, this is this is this is where my head's at. You know, yeah, especially yeah. after years of being, you know, disappointed by a lot of MCU villains. It's nice mm-hmm. to see. It's nice to see a character kind of given a very distinct arc the way he is, um, especially during his intro scenes in this movie. I'm like, this is a character that I would actually spend more time with. You know, and it. I, I remember the first time I saw this being like, man, like, like, you know, what's coming and right out of the gate, you kind of know it's going to hurt when it, when it comes, you know? So um, I was, I was looking for ways to poke hole, like to poke holes in that. And, and this viewing did not give me any, like, this is really a special performance. I love Spider-Man too. I love (laughs) (laughs) Otto. I love the whole thing. Um, It's interesting. Uh, Watching these all back to back to back, it's hard to articulate what is even different about Spider-Man 2 from Spider-Man 1. Hmm. So many of the elements are the same. It's just one villain um, that's familiar to Spider-Man fans from the comic. Uh, the The length and the plot is kind of even similar. If you remember at the end of 1, uh, prior to um, Peter and Norman's big final confrontation, he even does kind of like a uh, prison trolley problem with Peter and he like holds up the two things. You can say like a whole school bus of children or just Mary Jane. And that's kind of how that happens in this movie again, the second time with the train scene and Otto Octavius. So like so very little is fundamentally different for some reason. I just love this movie so much more. Uh, And I think it might come down to just like editing and CGI. I just think the CGI takes a bump, um, a bump up, and the transitions between Peter and Spider-Man look far more seamless. And I think Raimi and his editors just got sharper and better after having done it already once. Yeah, I was surprised as well by how many elements felt similar in these first two movies. But they do feel like very different, like not wildly different movies, but this this movie does feel different from the first. And I think part of that, in addition to the elements you mentioned, Alec, is that um peter is a little bit further along in his like superhero process and i'm a sucker for this superhero storyline which i feel like happens a lot like across tv and film superhero stories which is the superhero just being spread too thin and trying to do all of it once and being struggling between you know his two main identities and i feel like it's a very relatable storyline under modern capitalism like i think it's really we might not have superhero identities but a lot of us are trying to juggle a lot of things at once. And I think this movie does it really well. I like that they tie it to um, Peter's like working class background as well. Like the fact that he also has to find a way to make money while he's, you know, both being a student and in his other job as a superhero and how frustrating frustrating it is for characters, you know, like his professor to just categorize him as lazy. Um, And I like that those themes are really brought into the climax and the fact that how Peter inevitably defeats Otto or, you know, reasons Otto into defeating himself really or taking himself out is by being both Spider-Man and Peter Parker. Like he takes his mask off and he, he is Peter and he convinces him, you know, this isn't what you want to be doing. So he can't just be one of those, one of those identities. And I think Yeah, thematically between that and also the theme that is in the first one as well, which is having like the everyday people of New York come up to help Spider-Man. It's even stronger here and it worked really well in the first one. And I think that's an element of this, these first two movies that hasn't been done as effectively in a lot of um, other superhero movies past this. And it just gets me every time. (laughs) That opening sequence you know which is very working class with peter delivering pizzas um you know like that runs that runs pretty 
long, you know, like we start off with Peter, like picking up pizzas for like downtown for what appears to be a midtown delivery, you know, and in the process, like all this stuff is going wrong. And it's like a really fun superhero montage. And it's so different from the kind of stuff that we got with the character in the first film, you know, in the first movie, we got that origin sequence montage, you know, where it's like him learning his powers and this, that, and the other thing. And this movie opens on a Peter who was very much in control of his life as Spider-Man, but his life as Peter Parker is a, is a complete mess. Um, it's also worth noting that that pizza parlor is real and it is downtown <laughs> and it's on the corner. It's on the corner of like Bleecker and sixth Avenue. And it's awesome. Like not Joe's a sponsor pizza, of this episode. Yeah. Joe's still... pizza did not sponsor Marvel stand. However, if you are in New York city, go get yourself a slice from Joe's. I've probably eaten more slices from Joe's than anywhere else like in the world in my lifetime. And it's really, really good. Um, but yeah, like those, that like five minute sequence that kicks this movie off just encapsulates the character of Spider-Man so well. You know, it really is a shorthand for like everything you need to know about both the hero and just the regular dude. I think you really feel for him in this movie and his struggles feel very relatable. Um, it's not just the pizza parlor, obviously. You've got J. Jonah Jameson, who has this relationship with... Um, J.K. Simmons is absolutely fantastic in this movie, by the way, and it's my favourite part of it, like, beyond everything. Um, but I love that depressing relationship he and Peter have, where Peter's, like, fueling the public mistrust of Spider-Man by uh, selling his pictures to the Bugle, but he needs the money so much. Um like we live in this era where that exchange and those deals have been weaponized in a way both politically and with pr in general this thing of there's no such thing as bad publicity taken to it's like most extreme and disturbing ends but here it almost feels like um is jovial and it's played for laughs <laughs> you know um it it really adds to like the innocent feel of these movies when revisiting them day jonah jameson laughing uh yeah. <laughs> Peter asked for an advance is the funniest <laughs> thing I've ever seen. <laughs> it is so funny. <laughs> Amazing. Um, there are like to to your guys' points about um kind of the economic insecurities of Peter Parker uh in this movie. There's so many odd little details that just make the whole experience so much more rich. The fact that like his landlord is like maybe I don't know like the seventh biggest character in this movie. <laughs> like seventh on the call sheet is amazing. <laughs> um, the fact that he's always like interacting with uh, his landlord's daughter and like when I was a kid, I didn't even understand the purpose of including that. And I'm not sure I still do either. Like I think when I was a kid, I was just not used to seeing a, a male hero in a movie interacting with a woman, another woman who was not a hero, a villain, or a, a fellow romantic lead. Uh, and her last name's Ditkovich, which yes. I think probably, yeah. Yes, so, another, an, yet another uh, insufficient attempt by the movies <laughs> to pay tribute to Spider Man creator Steve Ditko in a way that he absolutely would have hated because Steve Ditko <laughs> hated basically everything. So, <laughs> also, I need to bring something up at some point, and this might be the good, the, a good time. Um, the amount, of, like I mentioned, you know, the landlord being like seventh on the call sheet, the amount of huge names in the, like from our perspective in the modern day that are just playing nothing in these movies is wild. I wrote down a list and I got to, if we're counting James Cromwell in three as a minor character, I have 20 recognizable people <laughs> in this movie that are just like playing nobodies. I feel like that was kind of a hallmark of, you know, superhero filmmaking of a previous era where it was like you definitely wanted to like cram as many celebrity cameos in into these things as you could you know i wonder if it's something that goes all the way back to like the 1960s batman tv series where not only did you have a special guest villain every week who was played by a celebrity but then you know there would be these weekly or semi-weekly cameos where batman and robin would be walking up a wall and a window would open and it's like it's sammy davis jr like talking to batman and robin so I wonder if like to some degree, this is just the studio being like, look, if we can get this person in here, like it might sell another couple of tickets, you know? Uh, I don't I know if that it, quite works as well in the internet era. 
I do want to hear Alex's actual list. I feel like we need to hear it. Yeah, let's but do I also, it. Write it down. Well, I just want to say before you do your list that thinking about this too, I think is a function of like the expansion of TV post this movie and obviously like a little bit more recently in terms of like what kinds of actors can get meaty roles. Um, because I think a lot of these actors probably have, you know, a lot of them have done like major film roles and I feel like maybe right now I should have let you read the list first. But also... <laughs> I bet a lot of them have appeared in some really cool, like, TV um, situations that maybe were not available, um, you know, even when Spider-Man 1 came out, or Spider-Man 2. Hit it, Alec. Okay, I'm looking at the chat, and uh, we're, you're on the right track, Lee, but uh, I'm not counting Bryce Dallas Howard, because her role's too big. But I'm talking, like, straight-up minor roles, like, would not appear on the poster within, like, the first six credits on IMDb. Joe Manganiello, Elizabeth Banks before she was Elizabeth Banks, kind of uh, macho man Randy Savage, Octavia Spencer, who has like two lines and is arguably one of the most successful people to appear in any of these movies. Uh, Macy Gray has a concert. Uh, Lucy Lawless wants to bang Spider-Man. Um, Jim Norton hates him and thinks he stinks. Dylan Baker who uh, is Kurt Connors, the aforementioned Asif Manvi, Daniel Day Kim, who I think is a doctor or a policeman, I can't remember, um, Hal Sparks of Queer as Folk, Emily Deschanel, who gets delivered those pizzas, Donnell Rawlings of Chappelle Show, <laughs> John Landis has a cameo, Peyton List, who is a, a younger actress who is appears in this movie as a child in an uncredited role, Joel McHale, uh, Joey Diaz, Phil Lamar, James Cromwell, Becky Ann Baker. That's a list. <laughs> There's a lot of just like, of people in these films. Yeah. And I think Fred Waugh, who was the stuntman in the 1970s live action Spider Man TV series, who was the guy that actually scaled skyscrapers and did like crazy stuff. Um, I believe he's in the first one as well. I think he like falls off a balcony during that Macy Gray concert. Uh <laughs> and this is shifting gears a little bit, but I did want to mention, and this is something I remember about watching the first one in theaters as well, um, how well the first movie sets this movie up. And which is interesting to me too, because now it just feels like it's a, of course, like a superhero movie is setting up like the next six superhero movies. <laughs> um, but the fact that it kind of ends on a few different like emotional cliffhangers, I think of them as like, you know, we get MJ finally like confessing in some way her feelings to Peter at the end of the first movie. And he's just like, nah, I can't do it. Um, that's a paraphrase. Um, and then also, you know, ending the first one with Harry, um, you know, seeing Spider-Man return his father's dead body to <laughs> his mansion. Um, yeah, it just, it, back in the day, it made me very excited to see the next movie and watching these movies back to back to back. It just made me realize how much was like seeded in that first one that would come into fruition in the second and third movies. Pretty much the only thing that doesn't really pay off is Dylan Baker is Kirk Connors, you know, um, like he's supposed to be, you know, he's of course supposed to become Spider-Man villain, the lizard. And given how devoted, uh, you know, Sam Raimi and the screenwriters seem to be to the early Spider-Man comics, uh, particularly in the first two movies, but you can see it in Spider-Man three with Sandman as well. The fact that we never got, a Sam Raimi version of the lizard is like one of the great crimes. Like I really wish we would have gotten that. You could tell that's something that Raimi really would have sunk his teeth into. Dylan Baker is so sympathetic and just like real and natural in his scenes with Peter in these movies. Like it's a shame. It's, it's a shame that we didn't get that. And we instead kind of, you know, had, had other villains that had to get shoehorned in. And what's funny is, and this is going to come back to bite the franchise when we talk about three in a few minutes, is that both Spider-Man 1 and Spider-Man 2 benefit from, like, there was a certain amount of restraint behind the scenes because Dr. Octopus was supposed to also be in Spider-Man 1. 
you know, like Spider-Man one was supposed to feature like, like the origins of both Green Goblin and Dr. Octopus and then have them team up against Spider-Man, you know? So that would have been overstuffed right out of the gate. And then in Spider-Man two, they wanted to introduce Felicia Hardy. They wanted the black cat as well as the Dr. Octopus story. And that wasn't going to work out either. So it's good. They kind of knew when to pull back, you know, but then of course, like later on, those, those instincts were, were kind of thrown out the window. Um, the only other thing that I really think we just have to touch on with Spider-Man 2 is that train sequence. Um, because especially at the time, it was unlike anything I had ever seen. Like, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's so well choreographed. It's like, it's like, other than the fact that it's clearly not New York, it's clearly Chicago, and that really drives me crazy. But like, <laughs> other than that, like, it's really, really awesome. Like, it's it's still like you know conceivably the best superhero like you know extended action sequence of its kind um you know and i was struck this time by how well it has aged you know like the cg in this does not look all that far off what we've come to be accustomed to in modern mcu and and other blockbusters this this is like the scene like before I rewatch these movies. This is like one of the scenes that you just remember. Um, and for some reason, the moment I always remember is, um, you know, when he's lifted back into the train and his mask is off. Oh, there we go. Yep. And um, you know that random man is just like he's just a kid. Like that that just struck me so hard when I watched this the first time and. I mean, I think as stayed with a lot of people, it's another moment of like just recognizing the Peter Parkerness of him, his humanity, and like, um, yeah, I don't know. There's such like empathy and warmth and togetherness and community in this that, yeah, is maybe even like more comforting on rewatch than it was when this movie first came out. I mean, it was very much a post 9 11 thing, I think. You know, mm -hmm. um, that was definitely a thing in these movies. But I did want, I no, did want I, to say one more. I don't know if you want to say another thing about this scene. No, no, no. Yeah, I do. I just want to say a quick thing. Um, I think it's a good scene, but we should ask ourselves a very important question about it. Would it have been better with more J.K. Simmons, Jojo than Jameson? <laughs> And if yes. we think about it for more than a second, I think we feel in our hearts that the answer is yes. You're right. You're right. Is it is it this movie or the first one that has like my favorite Jonah line? Slander is spoken. In print, it's libel. <laughs> There's something so likable about him, and I feel like it has to be the performance because, man, I don't know. I do another moment that stood out to me though was um, I can't remember if it's in the first one or the second one when um is it the green goblin or otto maybe otto comes to like find out who the person is who takes the photos of spider-man and he like protect protects his source <laughs> um which i don't know if that's just like i journalism ethics maybe not based on some of his other character moments but i don't know that's like a real that's an interesting moment for me my favorite thing, and this is like a relatively recent development in Spider-Man comics, is the idea that like, yes, Jonah is like, just like a terrible asshole, but he's not evil. You know what I mean? Like, he's not like through and through evil. And, and actually like underneath it all, like he's giving Peter a hard time because he actually like likes him and wants to build him up. This is just his weird like jerky, tough love way of doing it. You know what I mean? And when it's done right, it's really, really good. Like there were elements of this in Brian Michael Bendis, in the Brian Michael Bendis written Ultimate Spider-Man comics. And then recently there was an issue of Spectacular Spider-Man that was written by uh, Chip, Chip Zdarsky that is just like heartbreaking in the way it, it explores the whole Peter, Spider-Man and Jonah dynamic. And you know what? I absolutely believe that you could go there with this version of Jonah from these movies. I guess it really struck me in the second one, but this happens in the first one as well. Um, you know, the the superhero trope that the superhero has to choose between, like, someone he loves and, like, someone else. And I just... It just made me think so much about The Dark Knight and how that felt like a direct response to 
maybe maybe not just these movies, but um, to that trope. And it, it just I I don't think I I don't think I had really thought as much about the connection between specifically Spider Man Two and the Dark Knight. And this this rewatch had me thinking about that. Um, yeah, and now I have to rewatch those movies. So. <sighs> <laughs> The only other thing that I really just want to want to mention in this, because because these are Sam Raimi movies, and again because it's so rare for a director with such like a distinctive visual style to like have this much influence over an entire trilogy of superhero movies, the hospital scene, the birth of Doctor Octopus, is such a perfect Sam Raimi moment, and not even just in a like oh cool look here's Sam Raimi doing a supervillain origin story like thing. It's like if I was putting together a highlight reel of just the awesome stuff Sam Raimi has done, this scene would be part of it. Like, and this is him clearly having a blast going full on like black and white B movie with, you know, the, the octopus arms having a life of their own while this guy is on the operating table. It's great. It's the kind of thing that could only be done in movies. It surpasses the comics in ways that nobody ever really would have expected. And again, holds up really, really well. I hope he's able to bring some of that sensibility to Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness next year or this year. <laughs> this year, try like three months. Yeah, that's true. Right. Four months. Yeah. Um. So, we've talked about the ones that we really enjoy talking about, but there is a third. There is a third installment. There is another. Movies. <laughs> um. So. Spider-Man 3, which is, you know, kind of a problem child of the franchise. But you've come this far. It's another Sam Raimi movie. And let's face it, like Sam Raimi doesn't make bad movies. Like these things are all going to be worth watching. So it's good to remind everybody now that this episode of Marvel Standom is sponsored by Plex, the current streaming home of the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy. And you can watch Sam Raimi's original Spider-Man trilogy, including three, for free, presented by Crackle on Plex. This limited time engagement ends on March 1st, so act fast. Plex has over 50,000 free on-demand titles and over 200 live TV channels. Download the Plex app today, free on all your favorite devices to start watching. So, Spider-Man 3. Kirsty, why don't you tell us about this one? Okay, here we go. I'm really interested to hear what you guys have to say about Spider-Man 3. So, I'm going to get through this as quickly as possible. Uh, Spider-Man 3 was released in 2007, also directed by Raimi. It's set a year after the events of Spider-Man 2, and the film follows Peter Parker as he prepares to propose to Mary Jane. There are a lot of villainous elements in this movie, some would say too many. There's Uncle Ben's true killer, Flint Marco, aka Sandman. Harry Osborn, who's out for vengeance, thinking that Peter killed his father and Eddie Brock, who wants to take Peter's place at the Bugle and eventually becomes Venom. Peter himself is also a villain in this movie, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a bit. Raimi only wanted there to be two villains in Spider-Man 3, Harry and Sandman, but producer Avi Arad wanted Venom in there too, and Raimi was also asked to add Gwen Stacy to the lineup. With all these factors and a huge amount of visual effects, its production budget ran between 258 million and 350 million, and it became the most expensive film ever made at the time. Despite that, Spider-Man 3 grossed 894.9 million worldwide, so it was actually the highest grossing film of the trilogy. It received messy reviews, and the film is often viewed as the worst of the trilogy, thanks to those creative differences behind the scenes that made it kind of a messy movie too. Fair. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Um, but, you know, this movie almost hit the billion dollar mark five years before The Avengers, which is pretty crazy. And it tells you just how powerful this franchise was. And it tells you how much goodwill it had accrued after those first two films. I think most people would agree this is the worst of the three movies, but I think the experience of going in with that expectation versus like watching it in real time when it came out with the expectation of having watched and really enjoyed the first two, it's a much kinder experience. Um, 
especially as someone who, again, hadn't didn't have a lot of the comic book knowledge the first time around. Now that, you know, I've seen Eddie Brock in other things <laughs> um, or Gwen Stacy in other incarnations. Um, yeah, watching different um, manifestations of those characters is really interesting. And I think I also had forgotten how much these three movies feel like one big story, especially um, with the obviously with the central romance, but also with the Peter and Harry storyline. Um, and that really comes to a head um, in this movie. And I, I do, I do wish we could have seen the version of this movie that didn't have um, the level of studio interference that it did, because I think, again, having um, a character who's so personal um, to Peter and Harry probably being the most personal of of all of the villains across this trilogy is is such a powerful thing that is not easy to come by. You really have to build it. Um, and yeah, it feels like this movie kind of squandered it, but, um, but there's still, there's still a lot to enjoy about it. Um, whether purposefully or intentionally on the movie's part or not. And I think especially after watching no way home to, to revisit like the Sandman character, (laughs) um, was unexpectedly, um, yeah, delightful. Delightful might be the wrong word. He's he's a poor Sandman, but um, you know, it's fun. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll say this for Spider Man Three and really all of the Raimi movies. Um, well, we've we've complained before about how the, the MCU has a bit of a villain problem, um, which might be a bit outdated post the last handful of movies, which had some pretty good ones. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's really not the case in these Raimi movies. Like even Spider-Man 3, which is very clearly the worst of the three, um, I don't think any of the villains are at fault, really. I mean, like, Harry is not putting <laughs> not putting an A-plus effort necessarily, but, like, that arc still pays off pretty interestingly. Uh, Flint Marco as Sandman kind of covers a lot of the same ground that Otto did, just from, like, kind of a different socioeconomic perspective. And really, he's not really a full-on villain. He's just kind of compromised in, in, in one way or another. But the character design looks great and his arc works well. And then Venom uh, looks phenomenal. I, I, I forgot how cool Venom looks. Um, I, I, I re- it's a shame that they kind of mashed these two movies together. I feel like there was the Sandman movie and there was the Venom movie. And mashing them together did not work. They had to go one way or another. And I feel like if they had gone the Venom route uh, with Raimi's horror expertise and that character design, they might have really been working with something. I agree. Venom, first of all, Venom looks better in this movie than he does in the Tom Hardy movies. Like like every shot of Venom in this has more (laughs) weight and more detail and is more convincing than anything in those those Tom Hardy flicks. and yeah, like Raimi's horror sensibility works really, really well for him. Like the, the birth of Venom in that church, that's a really good scene, you know? Like, um, you know, there, there is something there's something to be said too about, look, you know, everybody's like, well, you know, Topher Grace is Eddie Brock, I don't know, blah, blah, blah. And that's like, that's fair, but that's not really his fault. I think the script kind of fails that character and the overstuffed nature of the script fails that character because there is something to be said for kind of making this character like a, you know, like an ax body spray version of Peter mm-hmm. Parker and seeing where you take it. But that scene in the church, like that's vintage Raimi again and it's great and it's a great visual. And then like later on when Spider-Man defeats Venom, it's like another great scene like that where he's like using the, you know, he's using like the girders as tuning forks to generate the noise. And I'm pretty sure at one point, I can't remember if it's during like this birth of Venom scene or during the death of Venom scene, but I'm pretty sure that you hear like the creature scream from John Carpenter's The Thing which is like exactly the kind of little horror movie touch that I know Sam Raimi would love to drop into these things. So there is something there. Um, It just doesn't, you know, there's just not quite enough of it. Um, I also do really like Sandman. The birth of Sandman scene in this is another like terrific Sam Raimi getting to play with 
all of the budget and toys that he's allowed to play with. So, you know, it's like right there. Like you could see, you could see what this movie could have been or movies. And like, it gets, it gets frustrating when you see the hints of greatness peek through. I agree. I think this, uh, this movie is just a bit confused. There are a lot of really great ideas here. They just don't come together. And I think it might be just that balancing the wholesomeness of the first movie, which was a success, and then the sadder edge of the second movie coming together in ways that don't just don't work together. You know, the wackiness of symbiote uh, Peter or whatever, and and then just a lot of other depressing stuff with Mary Jane just doesn't it just doesn't work together. Um, but I, I do think Sandman is a pretty good villain overall. Thomas Hayden Church is well cast. Um, I think the resolution of his story where he explains to Peter what happened with Uncle Ben, his, his forgiveness feels earned, despite how, what a mess the movie is. It really does actually work. Um, there's just too many elements sort of being juggled all at once, aren't there? It's funny, like the I think the story of these three films, or at least the thing that I take away, um, is that when it comes to to art and movie making, like the line between entertainment and cringe is so razor thin. Yes. Because imagine like Spider Man Two features a ridiculous musical montage, which like I know Mike, you said you weren't necessarily a fan of, but it's not like actively off- offensive. No. It just kind of like you know. Uh, but like it's it works. Choice. Well. Like... Yeah, it, doesn't bring, it doesn't bring things to a grinding halt. But then there's a similar musical montage in three, which is cringe. It's just like the definition of cringe. Um, but like imagine pre editing, pre music being added. Imagine like being on set for those two days of film, well, probably more than two days, but like those two instances of filming and trying to guess which one was going to come off as cringe. And I feel like you wouldn't have been able to guess that accurately just because the, the the line between the two is so razor thin. One got lucky and was executed well, and the other one was not. I mean, yeah. do you think it's deliberately cringe? Because Peter is a dweeb, so when he has, you know, the, the symbiote, he becomes a very cringe version of himself. Like, so it makes sense, right? It, it is deliberately cringe, okay. but it goes too far in that direction. It, it's just like, there's a way to pull it off somehow. And it, again, art is, it's hard. <laughs> like uh, execution on these things is hard. I think that's what they were going for with something kind of like goofy and cringy and like comic booky, uh, but they just went too hard. I think you're right, though. I think it is like a tonal problem. And I think it's it's maybe a thematic problem as well, because in theory, it's it's just unclear, like how much of this is this like a manifestation of Peter's personality? Like his like, is it like how much of it is, you know, Venom and how much of it is him? So therefore, it's unclear, like what? we're supposed to learn about this character or not from this stuff, not to like be too serious about it, but, (laughs) um, and also some of it, like rewatching it, I think some of his behavior that's supposed to be kind of like bad or evil, I actually don't think is that bad or I'm like, oh, he's just kind of standing up for himself and maybe he's being a little brusque, but I don't think he's being, he's evil in this instance. Like, I feel like he's communicating clearly that he has a boundary or that like, you know, especially when he's talking to like his landlord or um, Jay Jonah Jameson that, yeah, it's just really all over the place in terms of like what, what the behavior is when he's under this influence and how we're supposed to feel about it. So I think it's just confusing and that's not a good, it's not a good problem to have. <laughs> I, w- I will say that the scene where like kind of, you know, evil Peter goes to confront Harry one more time is really good. Mm. Like, like that scene between them is really good. And it is, it's like cringe in the appropriate way where it's like that that moment where two friends are deliberately saying hurtful things to each other because they know exactly how to hurt each other. Like, I think that scene plays really, really well. And, you know, it's the kind of thing 
look, all Spider-Man movies, I think, kind of have the same problem, which is that Spider-Man is, you know, emotional arcs in Spider-Man work best as kind of like longer form serialized storytelling. You know what I mean? Like there's an element of soap opera in Spider-Man that isn't necessarily present in, in a lot of other, like in a, in a, a lot of other superheroes. And this is the kind of stuff that like you could build a whole episode of TV around this, you know, but considering that these movies had such a compressed frame of time to do it, I think that's an amazing scene. And then it ends with like a really quick, seriously physical confrontation between them two, which is another one of those great, like Sam Raimi doing his ultra violent thing where like Peter hits Harry and Harry's head hits the wall. And like, I rewound that this time and watched it like four times. I'm like, ow, holy crap. That's actually like, that's like really nasty. Like, <laughs> so um yeah, yeah. There, there are good moments there. Like you, you, like you could see, you could see the movie. This could have been just barely making it through, and and it's impressive when it does. Yeah, I agree with you. It, it's like what, what you're saying before about how there are like glimpses of like a good movie in this movie, and that is definitely one of them. Because like all a lot of the other Venom like Peter stuff, he just feels like a goofball. <laughs> like you're just like a very like. Ye yelly goofball <laughs> um but this feels serious because he knows how to hurt his friend and he does and like there is like a certain kind of truth to his words as well and i think that's why in addition to physically hurting him it is so effective um and i think yeah i just feel like there's so much that they could have done thematically with that where it's like i do think peter often has a problem of like communicating with the people he loves most for some obvious reasons like but also there's so many points in the Harry Peter arc where I'm just like, you need to explain to him what happened. <laughs> and if you put like half as much energy into like just having a conversation with your friend who's like grieving his father, who he thinks was murdered by Spider-Man, as you did like pining after MJ, then like maybe things wouldn't have gotten this bad. <laughs> so yeah, I think using it as like a way of like, maybe he's like actually delivering some very like, harsh truths in a way that he wouldn't want to as Peter. But like, I don't know. Yeah, I'm just I'm just rewriting the movie at this point. But um, I agree with you. That scene is very, very effective. I think that's what works uh, better for me about the m more recent trilogy as well is Peter Parker isn't bogged down in a sort of depressing misunderstandings with his girlfriend or his friends, you know, Ned and um, Michelle are just there for him and they're a team and yeah I'm glad we've left a lot of that behind now or at least for a while. <laughs> Low-key MVP of this movie is Danny Elfman's score which I think is actually the best of the ones he did for this whole trilogy um, like and it seems like he had a lot of fun with it too uh, particularly the Sandman theme it really it, it has like a real 50s B movie flavor to it that I that I think really adds like a perfect dimension to the flick. Um, I might have bad news for you on that front. I could have sworn that I read in the credits that it just said like um, theme song by Danny Elfman and somebody else took over. Oh, that would that, that, uh, that yeah, would disappoint somebody else me. Did the, Danny Elfman did the music for the first two, and then uh, Christopher Young did the music for this one. Really? Oh, well, yes. he did an awesome job with that yeah. Sandman theme. Like, because it Congratulations, feels... Christopher. You're that secret yeah. MVP. What else like, even more Young secret done? than. <laughs> I'm hacking into the mainframe right now. Wow, Alec. Also, very <laughs> impressed with your detail oriented watching. His birthday is the day after mine. <laughs> okay. We're getting I'll the book for him previously. <laughs> He has, his compositions are, many of them are for horror and thriller films, including Hellraiser, Species, The Grudge, Exorcism of Emily Rose, Drag Me to Hell, Sam Raimi, Sinister, Deliver Us from Evil, Pet Cemetery. How does this movie relate to the current MCU Spider-Man, or how did it influence the broader MCU as a whole? Well, they knew what not to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing... <laughs> Because Spider-Man No Way Home has so many villains and so many characters. And I think we all have... Okay, maybe this is too much of a... I, I think Spider-Man No Way Home is a pretty good movie. Um, and I'm impressed that they're able to juggle that many villains, including some villains from this movie, there. <laughs> um, 
And again, it makes me want to rewatch that movie after having seen this to be like, what what was different? What worked? How are they able to juggle that many elements? Um, but yeah, I mean, it's hard to even just pinpoint all of the ways that like a foundational superhero trilogy like this has impacted both, you know, the subsequent Spider-Man movies and the MCU as a whole. Um, I will say one thing, which is it has taken the title Spider-Man 1, Spider-Man 2, and Spider-Man 3, which I'm very sad about because it's a lot easier to keep track of. <laughs> that was another one of my takeaways. I'm like, you know which order they're in. None of this, which home, <laughs> which home is it? <laughs> which movie am I talking about? So... Good job on the titling. Based on the names <laughs> alone, what should be the order of the home movies? I think Far From Home first, then No Way Home, and then Homecoming. Yeah, because it's like, I'm on my way home, or like, I'm really far, I'm on my way, I'm almost there, <laughs> I'm here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Some sort of logic for me to hold on to. <laughs> You know what? I don't think it. I knew this question was coming, and you'd think I'd develop an answer in the time that I had. But I think the honest answer is I don't. I don't think there's a lot of the this Spider-Man trilogy that really made it into the MCU conceptually or thematically, uh, particularly MCU by the time that Spider-Man joined it so late in the game. I think if a movie were to be influenced by these, it probably would have been 2008's Iron Man, um, and even then. Uh, it just does not feel, aside from the traditional third act structure with one villain who is somewhat related or has a, a relationship with the hero, uh, I don't think there's much beyond that, truth be told. Like I said earlier, I feel like this made me, this. it felt like The Dark Knight was such a response to these tropes um, and maybe this trilogy. But also I found myself thinking a lot more about... Um, like superhero TV, especially like the CW verse, like I think a lot of this reminded me of that. Um, yeah, which I don't know. Maybe because there's like a lighter tone, um, and also like like I said before, like more of a a simplicity to the visual style, which I feel like also just means it's like slower and yeah, clearer. <laughs> Uh, the camera work on like modern blockbusters, again, for better and worse, has just gotten very um, fast and busy and in the wrong hands. I think that can lead to, to yeah, to messy storytelling. It kind of feels like DC movies borrowed more from Spider-Man. Mm. And that's a little bit more on the cartoonish um, and, and stylized side. Well, I mean, certainly in as much as they're more likely, Warner Brothers, well, historically, it has been more likely to give a director the keys to a franchise and kind of let them let them put their stamp on it than Marvel has, has generally been willing to do. But as we've seen with, you know, Chloe Zhao and Eternals and a really impressive lineup of, of directors now, I mean, like, you know, Take a YTD and, you know, and Ryan Coogler and Sam Raimi. And like suddenly we have like an actual stable of directors like on tap for the next round of Marvel movies. So I'm really curious to see, you know, if they start getting the kind of freedom that Raimi cl clearly had here. Yeah, maybe that's the biggest influence. The fact that Sam Raimi <laughs> was a director of this of these films and, you know, showed that he had an interest and capacity to direct superhero films and is now going to direct a superhero well, film. Well, yeah, does Warner MCU. Brothers give does Warner Brothers give Christopher Nolan three Batman movies if Sam Raimi had not done this, you know? Mm. I think uh, Multiverse of Madness is going to be a real make or break moment for Marvel and whether it's ever going to let a director kind of develop a distinct style that deviates a lot from the house style. Because even, I mean, Chloe Zhao is coming off an Oscar win. Um, I feel like Eternal still just kind of looks like a Marvel's movie. With yeah. Some well, she it. also filmed it before she got the Oscar. Not that that... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard for me to imagine Marvel, like letting go of that much control 
We're going to start wrapping up this episode of Marvel Standing, folks. We will be back next week for the first of a two-part episode of Marvel Standing, where we are going to rank every single installment in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Just the big screen ones. TV is going to be something else. We're hopefully going to be counting down from 27 to 11. Yeah, that's right. That's the plan. And then the second part will be the top 10. And the results of the poll will be revealed to us at at this, right? At a like, meeting that you were not at yesterday. But, yeah, you didn't uh, mean that. <laughs> Wait, were they revealed? You're the only one who doesn't know. <laughs> Wait, are they just going to be revealed to me live? Yeah, yeah, yeah you'll, you will be the one who hears about them for the first time. Okay. No. <laughs> Ready? But yeah, this is a big one, folks. This was voted on by members of the Denny Geek staff and by Denny Geek readers and Marvel Standom readers. So this is a pretty cool aggregation of the total vote between the readers and the, uh, between the, the audience and the staff. It's something we haven't really done for like a total franchise before. It's going to be a lot of fun. So make sure you're here for us next week. Um, and then we have a lot of other fun special episodes planned between now and the launch of Moon Knight on March 30th. But I think that wraps up our special Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy, trilogy edition of Marvel Standom. I want to thank our sponsor, Plex. Make sure you download the Plex app and watch the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy presented by Crackle on Plex. Don't forget, you only have until March 1st to watch Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy on Plex. And Plex has over 50,000 free on-demand titles and 200 live TV channels for your pleasure. Download the Plex app today, free, on all your favorite devices. Just want to thank you all for joining me today. Thanks to everybody in the chat. Thanks to Lee Parham, our social media coordinator, for moderating the chat comments today. Thank you to our producer, Andrew Halley, for keeping this show on track and making this all look good. Make sure you are following us on Twitter, at Marvel Stand, and make sure you're also following our web home of at Den of Geek US. Make sure you check us out at denofgeek.com. And don't forget, if you're tired of looking at my face and who can blame you, you can also listen to episodes of Marvel, St Marvel Standom on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. If you are watching this on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe button. If you're here in the chat right now on Twitch, make sure you hit that subscribe button or at least follow us. What are you doing? Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next week. Stand together. I think it's a good scene, but we should ask ourselves a very important question about it. Would it have been better with more J.K. Simmons, Jojo than Jameson? <laughs> and if yes. we think about it for more than a second, I think we feel in our hearts that the answer is yes. Is he alive? Parker! Parker! He's just a Kid. He's a fake. He's full of stick'em. No older than my son. My son, the astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> you serious? You give this man his money and throw in a bar of soap. Pack your things. We won't tell nobody. It's all my fault. I drove Spider-Man away. Spider-Man was a hero. It's good to have you back, Spider-Man. I finally got to him. The power of the press triumphs. <laughs>